Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of No Reserve, Haggerty's podcast about the enthusiast car market. Now we're here to help you make sense of the market, whether you're buying, selling, or just watching. Now this week, the deals are here. We highlight several recent bargains, including a Datsun 240Z and a Mazda RX-8. We're also looking forward to several cars currently for sale, including a Pontiac Fiero and a last edition Dodge Challenger. It appears to be a perfect time to buy. Now, I'm Larry Webster, editor of Haggerty Media, and I'm joined by Dave Kinney, the publisher of the Haggerty Price Guide. Between us, we've got decades of experience buying, selling, and driving the cars we love. Plus, we don't just guess at the values, we're backed by the data of the Haggerty Valuation Tools. All right, let's get into it. Okay, Dave, we are recording this on Wednesday, September 6th. Um, last week was Labor Day, always sad, end of the summer, end of the big auctions. Uh, what's going on in your world? Oh, man, lots of things, lots of work assignments for one thing. Uh, you know, I, I guess I might have taken Labor Day weekend off and I shouldn't have taken the entire weekend off. But uh, this is kind of the end of the concourse season for a lot of people. Mm. Uh, there's a one or two more coming up, uh, you know, both in Europe and in the United States. But, you know, summertime's kind of winding down, but there's still plenty of time to do fun stuff. So uh, it's a pretty good time to be looking to buy a car, if you ask me. Yeah, I was going to say that. And, you know, one thing I wanted to talk about was this article that's on insider.haggerty.com. And this is about the, the the people who can authenticate cars as real and not fake. And this is just a big topic in the world. I know you've been involved in a lot of things and a lot of fakes. Like if we think about uh, cars misrepresented, what is one of the most famous frauds? in the collector car community. Can anything come to mind? Oh, there's been there's been examples of of cars that were faked that were sold as real cars, but usually it's about inflation. Uh, where oh. somebody says this is the original body on the car, even though the you know, maybe the serial numbers all match and all that sort of stuff. The car was wrecked and and somebody replaced a body, or in some cases replacing a chassis. It's it's usually incremental it's a little different than the art world where they have you know complete fakes that were attributed to an artist we're not to that level yet but this is a really great article on insider on haggerty insider um this is not for everybody okay i mean those you of mean us the article are, or the topic the topic the yeah. topic everybody should be aware of it everybody should read the article but there are people out there who authenticate the age of metal uh, the type of paint, the type, you know, the type of paint would have been originally used on a car from the 1930s or 40s or 50s uh, compared with what's on there now, uh, even even down to the surfaces like the interior surfaces and where the carpet was woven, you know, the, the you know, the country. But, you know, in some cases, the town uh, where that carpet was made, it, it's really specific. So they're trying to do all this with million dollar cars, mostly not with the stuff that you and I play with. I don't, I don't think, uh, anybody's going to come in and ask me, uh, you know, a question about my uh, Subaru later on, but, but you never know. I mean, these things are, are important to know and it's important to know there's people out there doing that. Yeah. This is fast. This is such a fascinating topic to me because, you know, we've talked about that, that Ferrari, that sold at uh, Monterey that was just a you know ball of rusted and twisted metal, didn't even have the engine in it. And somebody might restore it, and it's going to take uh, one of a handful of people to say, oh, this isn't a recreation, it's the real thing restored, and you're fine. So the opinions are really important. But the, what I liked about this article was that they it really highlighted some of the scientific efforts that are trying to authenticate these things in a more less opinionated way you know what I mean? i'll give i'll give you an example here that's uh, just amazing to me you know there are ships that are all over the sea and you know and including in lake michigan not far from where you are uh -huh. um that have wrecked over the periods of time yeah. some of the most valuable things that are now coming up from from the seafloor are metal that was made before World War II, I see, before I see. the mm. atomic age, because every piece of metal made after the atomic age, or almost every piece, sure. has an atomic element in there that wasn't in there before. So, you know, they're bringing up these freighters, you know, these rusty old freighters, and they're using some of the metal for some medical stuff right now that can't have any... Uh, 
any nuclear waste in it. I mean, isn't that, or any nuclear component in it? Yeah, amazing. Any fallout. That is yeah. amazing. Uh, I mean, just th- crazy. The, the, one of the things this article highlights, I remember, <laughs> you remember the Bullet Mustang came out. Sure. Oh, yeah. And that had been, you know, kind of hidden. Some people knew about it. And I remember because we broke the story on it. The owner was really nice to give us an exclusive. And I went to his house in Tennessee and I met him. And, you know, the car looked to me. I'd be like, oh, yeah, shit. This is it. It looked totally legit. But his ace in the hole was one person. I think it was a guy named Kevin Marty, right? Yeah. He went and saw the car and he looked at it. He said, okay, this all checks out. And then the VIN plate, which has the serial number on it, according to him and his opinion, it could it didn't look faked. And mm-hmm. his credibility, and you gotta correct me if I'm wrong, was enough in the car community to say, Okay, it's the real thing. And that's well, what, yeah. 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 Kevin's a friend. I mean, I, yeah. I I know him and I like him. Uh the good news about him is that he has the original uh, factory documents from Ford and Mercury and some sure. of the other, you know, Ford related companies. So, so he's seen this stuff and he's been out there. So he can do some level of authentic authentication that a lot of us can't do. So yeah, he's a primary. Authentication. Oh, what, what the hell does that mean, Dave? Jeez, oh, it's early, man. I'm sorry. <laughs> authentication. Okay. I can okay. say it. Okay, I can okay. say it. Good, Don't ask good. me to say kindergarten or you something never, like that. Dave, you never make a mistake. I got to pounce when you do. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, I make plenty of mistakes. Ask my wife. But 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 what I find interesting, if I went up and I said, okay, see this Vintag? Those rivets. You know what? They don't. They look like real to me. Like they came out of the factory. My opinion means nothing. Yeah. Zero. Yeah. No, yeah. Kevin no. Marty's everything. Exactly. I mean, that's because he's like been involved in you know what, one hundred and fifty thousand probably. Uh, you know, Ford. Uh, uh, you know, restoration projects in one yeah. way or another. Because he sells these documents, so he looks at this stuff all day long. But what's happening? And this is the the thing to leave everybody with. We are now in the same level in very, very, very many ways in fine arts. We're talking about the same things that people who are doing Picasso paintings and Renoir and old masters and all that sort of stuff. And that's where we are with some of these old cars that are worth multiple millions of dollars. Yeah. And they're really developing the processes and tools to do a scientific analysis. So it's not so opinion based. Yeah, exactly. That has always made me uncomfortable. And like yep. I said, it's it's this little closed community. I'm sure Kevin is a stand-up guy, really smart, but it's one person's opinion. Yep. And uh, the science is catching up, which if you go to insider.haggity.com, you can see this article. It's super interesting. And then the next one I wanted to talk about, because I've noticed this as well, and you're ahead of me as usual, in um, you know, sort of recognizing what's happening with Japanese cars in the U.S. collector car market. So why don't you bring everybody up to speed what your theory is? Okay, so listen, I've been around the car market before, uh, you know, the collector car market when everybody said there'll never be a collectible Japanese car. I remember this all the time. And then you'd say, what about the Toyota 2000 GT? And everybody would say, well, that's the thing that proves the rule, you know, all that sort of stuff. Then came along the 240Z and they were just cars for a long, long time, but they're more than cars. I remember the first time I saw one hit in the collector car market over 25,000. And wait, I'm like, whoa, 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 wait. You're going too fast for me, Dave. Okay. You, for, you forgot right. who you're dealing with, right? Yeah. So okay. the 240Z came out early 70s. They made tens of thousands of them. So then exactly. in the used market, they were disposable, right? Exactly. For a long time. And then at some point, you noticed one went for 25000 What time period are we talking about? Oh, we're talking probably, uh, I'm going to say 90s, actually. In the 90s? I mean, yeah, in the 90s. Oh, wow. uh, very, very late 90s, something like that. Uh, maybe even early 2000s. You know, they were always trading at the, you know, the kind of eight, nine grand type of mark for a long, long time. And then all of a sudden, one popped up at over 25000 I, I literally said to myself, well, that's it. I mean, these things are going to go crazy. So you went out My, and bought everyone you could find at that point, no, being that I, intelligent I, person you are. No, I did not do that. I appraised <laughs> a few of them, but I didn't buy any of them. Uh, but anyhow, uh, long story short, you know, there was this this thing that everybody just took for granted, that there was no such thing as a collectible Japanese car. It was BS. It always was. It always will be. You know, we're, we're way past that now. My point in making this article that I wrote for Haggerty Insider is, is that there are a lot of people in the Japanese car market right now who've never seen a down market. 
Um, you know, you buy the car, you keep it for five years, you make money. It's just a given. And that's not true. Uh, you know, things happen and sometimes, you know, tastes change. So the same people who are crazy for a 240Z, uh, you know, might now be crazy for a Lexus LFA, uh, you know, something along those lines, or maybe a JDM car, a Japanese domestic manufacturer car. Interesting. So, wait, 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 wait. I want to get this straight. Hey, okay. Listen, I trust you. I call you Big Papa for a reason. <laughs> so, wait, are you saying like, my cars might depreciate. What? You sitting down, bud? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It happens. Oh, no. Uh, just ask anybody who, <laughs> uh, you know, who's been there and done that. What I'm am I going to tell my wife? Oh, I'm no. raising my hand right now. Well, <laughs> you know, well, you can all just do like everybody else. It's like, well, I bought it for 20 and I sold it for 25. And, you know, everybody's, <laughs> wow, great deal. And then you don't tell them about the nine grand you spent of in course. between the 20 and the 25, yeah. you know, whatever. And that's and that's fine. No, it's just a, a little bit of a cautionary tale. There's great news in the Japanese car market. I mean, we saw some amazing sales in my Monterey. Uh, Broad Arrow had a 95 NSX uh, Type R that sold for 632000 yeah. And one sold, uh, an LFA sold at, uh, at RM for one million one oh five. I mean, you know, that's a record. So there are a lot of records out there. Um, I find, and, I mean, this topic is so fascinating to me, Dave, because I, I take my cue from McKeel Haggerty. Sure. He, told, he gave me the best quote, because I know I always done this. He's like, I don't know about you, but I buy high and I sell low. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah. <laughs> and I yeah. was like, that's exactly what I do. I'm in this for fun and yeah. I own it. And I think all these folks, it, it has one downside of all these auctions and focus on the market, which is great. It made us all better or it's a safer place to buy and sell. But it's created this situation where that your status in the community is kind of based on if you make money or not in the cars you own which I hate. Hey, Larry. Yeah. I own a 2022 F-150. Okay. Yes. Yes. So when I took it around the block for the first time, I yes. realized I just lost a couple grand. Of course. Right. And that's just fine. I know. And I think it's hilarious. I'm in the collector car market. I've been in it for almost my entire life. And I think it's hilarious that everybody thinks they can buy a collector car and it'll automatically go up in value. If that yeah. were true, I would be a billionaire like you. I mean, yeah. you know. Well, you know, okay. So. Well, let me run something else by you. Like as a dealer between you, Comer, all these guys, not it's not perfect, but I think the perception is, is that you're buying a car ahead of the curve because it's going to appreciate. And that's part of it. But then what a lot of people don't realize is a lot of what a dealer will do, especially a classic car dealer, is they'll put a lot of sweat equity in the car. Sure. Absolutely. They'll get the car. They'll fix it. They'll cosmetically improve it. They'll clean the undersides. They do all this stuff that adds value to the car. And maybe they saw a diamond in a rough, but they polished it to a diamond level. Fair? I'll leave you with this. Uh-oh. Dealers will always tell you, you make the money when you buy the car, not when you sell the car. So you're absolutely right. They see the diamond, you know, they see this scattering of papers that this person has all around their house yeah. and it's not in a file and it's not cohesive. They put that together along with puffing and buffing the car, yeah, yeah. making it look better uh, and making it more cohesive and making it right for the next driver. You know, a lot of people are, are afraid to buy a new set of tires for their car because, oh, my gosh, it's going to cost seven hundred dollars. Well, the dealer will put that into their, you know, into their value when they buy the thing so you know that's that's a good point you make yeah. your money when you buy and um the other thing about the japanese cars uh and fads i i think when i saw like 240z's they crested six figures right the best ones were 120 130 and as you point out in the article they have now become absolute on fire bargains like yeah. you know you pointed out that one that was restored by the nissan factory to the highest level just sold for 66 grand I couldn't money, believe I couldn't believe that because, you know, yeah. we've got another one that we're going to talk about here coming up when we talk about cars. Well, shouldn't we be talking about cars instead of articles? No, but you point out this stuff. I love this. Like the, the car community is so fixated with fads. And I've told the story before where when I first started Haggerty, I was started going. This was like eight years ago. I started going to classic car auctions at every classic car auction. There was always one Toyota FJ40 Jeep. <laughs> always one. 
Right. And I was like, wait, what? And they always sold for like a hundred grand. I was like, wow, that's a lot of money for that thing. It's basically a tractor. And I think they're at a faddish favor too, right? I feel like I'm seeing those trades lower. Okay, so here's what happens, Larry. Let me give you a little lesson. (laughs) Everybody goes out and they restore their FJ40. So then the marketplace has 50 FJ40s. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. So it's flooded. The the market gets flooded. There's only 25 people looking for them and 50 are for sale. So what happens? That 125 car goes down to 85 or 90. And, yeah. uh, you know, creates quite a bargain because somebody spent a lot of money on that thing, making it look like and making it act like and making it be like a hundred and twenty five thousand dollar car. But boom, uh, when the when the next thing comes around. Yeah, they're not there for it. Yeah. And we've got some cars we're going to talk about shortly. And I got to I, I, um, I, I have to say you, you've you've highlighted cars that sold and I saw them and I was. I actually got kind of annoyed at you, Dave, because again, I, yeah, I thought we had a deal. Like when you <laughs> see these things happening, you'll just call me. Just say, yeah. dude, did you see this? Because yeah. I I am noticing a similar trend where I'm coming across more and more cars. I'm like, wait, it sold for that? Damn it. And six months ago, I don't think I had that feeling at all. So the cooling that, you know, insider.hagerty.com and you and I have been talking about seems to really be taking hold. Is that your, uh, do you feel that way as well? Yeah, there absolutely is some cooling in the marketplace and cooling is a good thing. We don't want anything to bust. We want it to cool down slowly if it's going to go down. And there's a little bit of air coming out of the marketplace and that's just fine. Nobody's, you know, nobody's running for the exits once again. Uh, but yeah, there's some, you know, and I will tell you another thing, Larry. I, I've always said that if you go to an auction, there's always going to be one bargain there. The bigger the auction, the more chance you're going to find more bargains. And you're always going to find overpriced cars, uh, no matter what. Uh, you know, that's the fun part of auctions. Um, are you the smartest guy in the room when you have your hand up in the air or the dumbest guy in the room? And only time will tell sometimes. So I've been yeah. both, believe I mean, it. listen, I've got sucker. Like, it's like tattooed on my forehead, Dave. But that's why I need you to highlight this shit for me. <laughs> Yeah, we're working on it. Well, thank you for uh, writing that article. I thought it was super interesting, and it was sort of like one of those where it's sort of been percolating in the back of my head, and then I read, I was like, yeah, 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 which is just kind of, you know, you're highlighting a trend for our readers, so that was really great. But let's move into our opening bid segment. This is where we talk about cars that have already sold and what we thought of them. I mean, Dave, what's the first on your list? Well, it's a 61 Jag E-Type. It's the third right-hand drive Roadster made, and it sold over the weekend, Labor Day weekend here in uh, England, in London, uh, at Gooding & Company for $1,145,000. Now, this is the first time an E-Type that we know of has exceeded $1 million. Now, this is not a, you know, not a misprint, you know, whatever. This was a great car, right-hand drive in the right place, so it's a right-hand drive market. Our Haggerty price guide, now this is embarrassing, our Haggerty price guide tops out at 348000 I mean, maybe they were just serving some really good booze at this auction. Yeah, that's what it was. No, I think that, uh, you know, I think this is a legit, uh, you know, obviously it's legit. They also had a coupe that was a no-sale that could sell for even more than this, becoming the second car uh, that exceeds a million dollars. So uh, right now... I don't know if it's a trend or what we're just witnessing or some outliers, but good on Gooding. Uh, $1,145,000, that's a lot of money in anybody's language for an E-Type. Uh, special car, early car, obviously, third third right-hand drive car. But, I mean, you imagine the next morning the guy who owns the second right-hand drive car waking up and going, yeah, I think I'll have the full English breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> this is a fascinating sale. I mean, yeah. how do you quantify the third one off the production line versus your point, the second or the fourth. I, I mean, I couldn't tell you. Maybe you could. You can. No, you can't. You're not that smart. No, there's always a premium for number one. Number two, it drops down a bunch. And then when you get in the third, fourth, and fifth car, it becomes more interesting than valuable, but it's still valuable. Um, you know, it's early stuff. That's as the designer wanted it to be. Not as the manufacturer made changes or the designer and manufacturer and the accounting department all got together and said, yeah, if we remove this one bolt and move it over here, we'll save a dollar fifty per car. So, I mean, there's a lot to be said for that. So this is yeah, for yeah. The, okay. the, on the flip all original. side, though, 
the this is 61 by 65 you know the e-type's got the 4.2 liter engine they got better electronics they had a lot of developments that made the cars a lot more enjoyable right yeah that's why the first of the of a series and the last of the series are what collectors usually look for so the earliest uh, you know mark 1 or you know uh, jag uh, you know, the, the first series of Jags, not, the, not when they made the major changes and went into the, uh, uh, the second series. Uh, but so people like the, uh, the first of that as also, also, as well as the last of that, just before the, you know, the series two came along. Yeah. It's a remarkable sale, especially considering it's right-hand drive. So that really limits the size of the market. Yeah. Um, I mean, it is in a beautiful color and we all know E-types are the most gorgeous car ever made. I mean, I, I remember seeing my first one. I mean, I, most people remember the first time they saw an E-Type. And, yeah. you know, their their jaws hit the floor literally because they are so gorgeous. And it's amazing because they're not Italian. So, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, maybe this is a sign that the, the, the cars were really hot for a while and then they kind of cooled and i maybe this is a sign that they're they're getting appreciated yet again do you have a sense well i you know when you're in in 300 sl territory uh, there's a hell of a lot more e-types out there plus they had three series of them and you know a lot of people discount the third series as a gentleman of size that's my favorite series because i can actually fit into a series oh, three e-type yeah, right. uh, but uh, um long story short um there's a, a hell of a lot more e-types than there are 300 sls so I think this is all about the restoration of the car, selling at the right place at the right time, and the fact that it's a very, very early car. Uh, you know, selling in England, right-hand drive in the in the correct market. So, good, but, uh, good on them. I mean, everybody should be happy with this. This is, a, you know, this is now one of those things with your E-Type that's, a, you know, you've always counted as a hundred and fifty thousand dollar car. Uh, you know, stay tuned because things might change. Oh yeah, they're great cars. Did Nikhil ever tell you the story about his E-Type or the one that's in the Haggerty collection? That no, was, no. It was an original car, one owner, somebody found it in a barn up in northern Michigan, didn't need restoration. Somehow McKeel found, heard about it, called the owner and says, okay, well, what do you want for it? And she replies, well, the Haggerty price guy says it's worth whatever. He goes, well, I guess that's what I'm paying. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've had that happen to me actually. I went to look oh, at really? the, I went to look at the car and the guy says, Well, Haggerty says it's uh, you know, and I said, Well, Haggerty would also tell you it's not a number two, it's a number three. Right. And you know, we went back and forth and I said, Hey, listen, full disclosure, I'm the publisher of the price guide. So I don't know if he had a laugh. I had a laugh about it, but uh you know, that's fine. That's fine. Hey, you know, and uh, you know. Yeah, I'm going to say this again. We publish a guide. We don't publish a Bible. If you oh, think your I know. Car's, if you think your car is worth more, if you think your car is worth less, as we say down at the Presbyterian <laughs> Church, muzzle tough. I just love uh, the story for his sense of humor about it, yeah, which is, no, you know, it's great. we're here to have fun and we're here to enjoy this and we're not going to sweat over a few bucks here or there. And, you know, he got a great story out of it. Uh, the next one, I, I think I am so curious to to hear your analysis of this. This is a 2011 yeah. Porsche 911. It's a Speedster model, a special version of the convertible. It only had a thousand miles on it. So this car is what they call that wrapper car, which it, it really bugs me. It sold for $321,000 um, just yesterday. Um, Dave, your thoughts on this? I think it's cheap. What? Yeah, we have these in the price guide for a lot more, a lot more. Oh, you're kidding! You're no, kidding. no, our number two is three seventy nine. Wait so, a second. In ten years, a... wait, 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 Dave, Dave, Dave. Yes. Well, 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 I'm so like, I, I'm so upset. I, I'm like, I'm having trouble getting my words out. Um, <laughs> this was new, two hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay. So there's a couple things going on here. Number one, you and I both remember these cars when they came out, and you were probably a hater, weren't you? So come yes. on, you can admit it. You were a hater. Why you was said, I a hater? Why? Because it was a decontented Porsche that they were selling for more, and they were using the revered name Speedster and bringing it back. And it's wrong, wrong, wrong. I stand by my opinion. It's still okay, right. You're today. wrong again. You're wrong again. <laughs> No, I mean, seriously, a, a lot of the, I, I think I could make the most money I've ever made in the car world by following around and seeing 
which car, BMW guys, Porsche guys, uh, you know, name your favorite brand. I'm, you know, I'm just stuck on Italian cars now, Ferrari guys. And the one that they hate, the one that they hate because of some inane reason, like, you know, they're, you know, they're making my 56 Speedster worth less by bringing this crap out. Uh, you know, whatever you can make a ton of money off of the, of those guys because the market wants what the market wants. It's a cool ass car. I love actually, and I love the cool ass of this car because I like the, you know, the kind of big bustle back thing that it has going on on it. So I think these cars have got a lot more room. They're usable. They don't have a back seat. I get all that, you know, whatever, but they're usable and they're fun. And it's part of the Porsche story. It's part of the Porsche lexicon. I love these things. I tell you, well, okay, you're, you're, I don't know where to start in telling you you're wrong. You're okay. so wrong. Well, you're you know, so hey, wrong. we can agree to disagree, okay? It's possible, all listen, right? Listen, listen, this is an automatic. It doesn't even have a stick shift, this car. $321,000. Like, it's not an automatic. They don't call them automatics. In, uh, it's in, an automatic. Uh, they no. call it a PDK. There's no clutch. There's no uh, clutch pedal. Dual clutch automated automated transacts. I know a PDK. Oh, that hurt this car big time. I mean, there's no doubt about it. But if you're just going to have it in fun driving, and plus, you know what they say the, uh, you know, the stick shift is the millennial uh, anti theft device because so many people don't know how to drive them anymore. We're I, living in an era where even people like Porsche at some point are probably going to not do manuals except for special editions. This is just a fascinating sale for me because specifically for the. The, the idea of substitution yeah. and you know you know remember that that 911 was it the e or and now it's got the st they they made these really fetching sporting versions and the gt3 touring which are pretty you know top 10 drivers cars mm -hmm. just the whole deal and they're trading for about this money that's where this one is odd to me also because in today's market over time um Late model cars that have convertible tops tend to tr be less valued than coupes, right? Mm -hmm. So this bucks that trend. Yeah, and, yeah. And and it just feels like this was Porsche gouging its company, its customers. Oh, oh. And, and they did, and now it continues to happen. So, I mean, I, I'm with you. People like what they like, and awesome. I hope they enjoy it, but it's a head scratcher to me. It really is. This is a mystery, and I thought you would be reasonable and smart and i feel like you're following the herd once again and you're you know i tell you what when i saw this car and like you said it sold yesterday i put it in yesterday and i said i know that larry and i are going to disagree about this car yeah, and i yeah. think i think this is a case where we're both right i really do i agree with all your points you got to look at it. And, you know, once you're old and mature like me, you'll 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 look back on it. And you'll be smoking the cigar with the dog at your feet with a you know a glass of port in your hand. And you'll say, you know what? Dave Kinney had a couple good points about that speedster. I hated so much. Just well, saying. It's kind of funny because, you know, this is another one of those wrapper cars undriven. And whoever bought it, maybe they have enough money. They don't mind. They want to use it. But it's, it's unlikely this thing will turn a wheel. And. You know, uh, one of the things Haggerty Media produces is, is a magazine, a printed magazine for the Haggerty Drivers Club. And if you'd like to actually support us and what we're doing here, what you can do is sign up for the Drivers Club. It'd be really great. You get this great magazine. The current issue that's just out is all about the love of patina. And this was uh, something I came up with last year, the idea of celebrating patina, because as I joke, cars come to me to die. And... <laughs> I wanted to, um, I just wanted to highlight that, that, that all the attention goes to obsessively detailed cars and it creates an expectation that I, I personally, I felt like I was letting my kids down. So that's why I wanted to do this issue to sort of get a feel for what like slightly worn cars are like. Can we appreciate those too? And you wrote I, a great piece. I got to say that. Uh, did I tell you how much I like that you wrote in that? Oh, issue? thank you. I appreciate it. You, yeah. You're you're being very complimentary to me. I, you know, I no, I, I said you were wrong about the Porsche. And you're I really know, dumb. I know. But you know, yeah. the stuff, the stuff that I, I have these opinions that I don't put in print, and I think that's that's where we differentiate, right? So. Well, the fun of it was, uh, you know, we had a lot of these pieces saying, "Look, it's only original once," and that's the history that you're you're. 
you're trouncing over if you restore it. And then you come in, you're like, yeah, but I really want the car shiny and new. Like I envisioned it in 1978. And I was like, yep, they, yeah. they, you're, we're both right. You're yeah, right well, too. <laughs> this, you know, there's nothing wrong. You can do whatever you want to with a car. I mean, yeah. I would, I would appreciate if people don't buy a car with great patina and then turn it into a brand new car if they don't have to. But if you've got one that's run down, you know, you got a good choice. I mean, you know, if yeah. it's beyond patina and into, oh, a rat's nest, then, uh, uh, you know, go ahead and restore it if you want. Do what you want. I mean, it's your money. You can do what you want. It's America. You know, really? It's supposed, to, it's supposed to be able to do all oh, that stuff. So shit. let's, let's you, do Dave. what we want. Thank yeah, you. you're welcome. That's such you're welcome. a relief. Yeah, thanks. I, you know, I, know, I know you needed that. So well, yeah. well, let's move on to an example. I mean, this is you didn't just throw out a thesis about Japanese cars. You Now you gave us two examples to prove your point. What's the first one? Uh, the first one is a uh, one of these restored, you know, factory authorized restorations, okay, of a 72 240Z, sold at Monterey, uh, sold for $66,000. It was a smoking deal. A Wait. smoking deal. Yes. Well, I'm confused because you've got one that sold on Bring a Trailer. Mm-hmm. Oh, the Meekum, the Meekum one, the yes, yellow Meek- one. Yeah, that's the one that was, uh, you know, highlighted in the article there. And, I'm you know, sorry, smoking deal. But there was one that sold on Bring a Trailer that if I live to be 300 years old, I don't think I'm ever going to understand this. What did this wait, thing wait, go for? Wait, let's go back to the Meekum one. This is what okay. I'm talking about. Like, why were you on the fucking phone, Dave, going, oh, sorry, <laughs> somebody bleeped that. And, and going, dude, listen, you're buying half a 240Z with me right now, okay? And I'd be like, whatever you say, Dave, click. And then you're not going to own this thing. Like, yeah. I mean, did you, were well, you there when one, this was happening? Number one, there were five auctions going on, if you remember. And number two, there's a whole bunch of other things going on. So I couldn't be in every place yeah, yeah. every time. They, 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 so. they, 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 Big Papa's got his tentacles everywhere. You're getting information. <laughs> you've got bowls everywhere. Somebody tipped you off that this was happening. I know we did. No, I didn't find out about it until later. There are two, oh, cars, okay. there are well, two cars that make them that I would have bought. There were two things missing. My presence and looking <laughs> at the car, and two, my checkbook. My checkbook was not there. It's uh, shall we say, previously engaged this month. So uh, you know, sixty six thousand sounds like a bargain, and it is. But I didn't have sixty six thousand dollars in <laughs> extra money hanging around. So right, that we, was we, the problem. I would really. I mean, that is something I was thinking. Like, boy, you can make a lot of money. Maybe you already do this, but like, just going to a live auction with you, and just getting the blow by we're gonna have to do this we're gonna have to figure out when broad arrow has their live auctions next year we're gonna have to MC it okay yeah, yeah i'd love that that'd, that'd be great that. fun yeah we yeah. could do it you know like color commentary but but this car this was fascinating because this was uh i want to say in the early 2000s they were bringing the z back nissan was so they went out and restored a bunch of these things. And then, if memory serves, they started selling them. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. They were going to do 200 of them. I think they said they got 37 of them done. Right. Um, it was kind of a big deal. I mean, name another yeah. manufacturer with the uh, cajones to go ahead and, you know, start a program like that. I mean, obviously, you know, part of my point was that other manufacturers do it, but they're mostly like Ferrari and people like that. And they're doing it to million dollar cars. Well, this was, you know, done under contract from a, you know, done for by another shop but they used all uh you know nissan slash dots and you know uh new old stock parts on the car so they made it as original as possible and they sold it with a warranty okay so just like it was like a reborn z now do you think i guess if you want original you want original it's original but we have a video on our youtube channel that henry catchpole went to england and there's an outfit that resto mods these things and With the right induction and internals where you could rev these motors, they sound insane. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And um, I wonder, you know, if I was going to get a 240, this is a deal. I would have bought it, too. But I kind of want the Ripper version, too. You know what I mean? Like, do you think that hurts the value of an original? Could that be why this thing sold for half of what it would have 10 years ago? I don't know. Uh, You know, different marketplaces, different times. Sometimes, Mm. you know, sometimes cars just sneak out of an auction because nobody's paying attention. Oh, look. There's the yellow Z. Kind of nice. What's it worth? I don't know. Maybe 50, 60. Uh, nobody did the research on it. Nobody looked to see that it was one of these program cars where, you know, it was actually rebuilt and reborn by the folks at Datsun. Uh, well, at the folks at Nissan. Okay. So this one was, it was arguably the steal of the Monterey auctions. One of them. 
one of them. Oh, I've seen yeah. Her other. yeah. And now on the flip side, you've got one on the I can't explain the high price version. And this was the car that sold on Bring a Trailer. This was a couple of years ago, actually. It looks like it was a little bit old, but it sold for three hundred ten thousand dollars. So I see what you're doing here, Dave. Tell us. Yeah, this is a car that sold in uh, January of 2020 uh, that sold for $310,000. I'm just giving you the flip side of this, okay? Yeah. Now, this is an exceptional car. There's dig, apples and oranges, okay? This is a survivor, a 21,000-mile car. They went through it. They did it with all the paint gauges. It's the right color. It's the British racing green with the tan leather interior. But $310,000, keep in mind that you could buy not one, not two, not three, but almost four of those $66,000 cars for $310,000. That's just my point. You know, early car. Uh, you know, this was a one year earlier, so it's an earlier car. It's got a lot of stuff going for it. Not dissing on this car, but, you know, if you wanted a car and it had to be a 240Z, you got all kinds of choices. But here are some of the, you know, some of the things that happen in our marketplace. That's all the reason I got it in there original unrestored the absolute yeah. top of the 240z world yeah is three hundred ten thousand dollars yeah exactly exactly it is amazing but yeah. that's six six thousand one i mean that's gonna haunt me uh, actually you know what the next car that you highlighted is even more haunting to me because i've sort of been casually looking at these it's a 2004 mazda rx8 it's only got thirty thousand miles it recently sold on cars and bids for just 9500 bucks is a yeah. screaming deal Yep, 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 yep. And I mean, when's the last time you saw one of these on the street? I haven't seen one in a year. I mean, I know they made a bunch and they were not, you know, they were not big sellers like, uh, you know, the RX-7s. But, uh, but I mean, they're getting rare and rare and rare. Uh, this one's got a uh, accident-free Carfax, got a couple little problems that they mentioned. No, no big deal. Uh, but, it, you know, the, it looks like that the, uh, you know, the engine's been tended to, all that sort of stuff. $9,500, a gift, a gift. A red with black uh, RX-8. Uh, what's the miles on this thing? Now? 30,000 miles. I mean, yeah. these cars are wonderful to drive. I, I mean, I've spent a lot of time in the previous version. This was the uh, the RX-7, RX-7, not the RX-8. It's called the FD, the last one, the twin turbo, which is like very extreme driver's car. Brilliant machine. This one, um, boy, they felt every bit as glued to the road with, you know, just sublime steering feel linear brakes you know the downside of that motor it has no torque you're revving it like crazy but it's super fun to rev it yeah it is. and it, it was kind of practical the downside i heard of these things they just had a lot of reliability issues like if yeah. you if you'd start it and if it happened to stall you're calling the tow truck it won't start and you yeah, know stuff like not that. always not you know, always but i heard a lot of stories like that You've talked to a guy who's owned five, six, seven, I think, uh, no, six uh, rotary powered vehicles in their lifetime. So, uh, you know, I, I I'm, three. I'm a believer, except for, you know, the, the old joke about it pass everything but a gas station was absolutely true. Yeah. Uh, this car, by the way, has the six speed manual. Uh, yeah. So it's the one you want. I mean, at 9,500 bucks, you know, everybody's always saying, what car should I buy to keep? you know, to have for a Sunday driver, you know, whatever. And this has been on my list, but I'd always figured you'd pay 15, maybe 20 for this car, you know, exactly. or, or 18 for it. This one I got agree. out for 9,500. So there we go. It's another one of those that I'm really kicking myself. If I had seen this at 10 grand, I would have bought it all day. I mean, I think it's a deal and they're just fun, fun cars to own. So, uh, again, we're highlighting the bargains are out there. And oh, yeah, every yeah. time we speak, we're sort of like, Hey, this was a pretty good deal. You know, more and more of that is happening. So uh, I think what you said in the beginning, it's a good time to buy. I haven't seen it this good time to buy in years. Yeah, I think years. you're right. I think you're right. There's a lot of opportunities out there if you're uh, if you're looking to buy that just didn't exist a year ago. So Okay. Yeah. This is going to be a bargain, this next car. It's currently for sale. We're switching gears to our next segment called Kicking Tires. This is about our upcoming sales. This is currently for sale on the Haggerty Marketplace. This is a 1986 Fiero GT. This is the same car that Camisa did his really great video on the Fiero and what happened. And he made fun of him, you know, catching fire and all that stuff. And I thought GM was going to be all up in our business after this. But it was really funny and cheeky. And he really kind of highlighted what makes the car special and unique. Um, you know, right now it's... Uh, 
the bid is only six thousand bucks. I think crazy. Yeah, just crazy. Yeah, somebody's going to get a de- somebody could get a deal here. Is this the car that the actual car that Camisa used in it? Yeah, it was, wasn't it? That's car, yeah. right. Unbelievable. And it's, and it's, and it's six grand. Yeah, that's V6 uh, with the five speed. You know, the old joke about uh, General Motors, uh, you know, getting it right and then canceling the project. Yeah. Never truer than with the uh, than with the Fiero. You know, they had this problem and that problem and everything else. And then by the time the GT came around, it was a damn good car and, a you know, a Dragon Slayer and, a, you know, a, one of these cars that was a lot more than anybody gave it credit for at the time. Now, we have in the price guide, we have a number one at 16.6, a number two at 10.1. Now, this car is hovering right at our number three which is $6,500. My goodness, get out there and buy. Hey, why don't we split this one? Now, I do have three grand I could probably put towards something. What do you, what do you I think? split this with you. Although a friend of mine has a, the, the 88 is generally more valuable because yep. they redid the suspension and, and it's considered to be better. But they're in the, I mean, a really good one is seems to be 25 to 30. Oh, yeah, yeah. You can actually see them. Uh, you know, 25 is not, uh, you know, not unheard of in in good later 88s, like you said. So, right. So this yeah. one being an 86, you do get the five speed, you get the V6 and you get those really fetching uh, rear sail panels that they added. So you get, a, you know, 75 percent at a 50 percent markup or bargain, perhaps. I yeah. Mean, yeah. And, you know, remember, they built excitement. <laughs> they had a very unique font for all the gauges and the speedometer that was, you know, really looks crisp and stuff to me um, in hindsight. So uh, I would split this with you. I mean, let's watch it. Let's see where it goes. And um, if it's a screaming bargain, I'm just going to buy it, Dave, and then I'll call you to send me the check. All right. Uh, you take MasterCard and Visa? <laughs> Whatever you want. Whatever all you want. right. All right. All right, what's the next one on your list? Oh, 84 is... Rabbit GTI on oh, key car market. Oh, okay. Oh, no oh. bids yet. No bids yet. Okay. <sighs> I mean, you know, hey, we can both relive our youth. You, you, your very early youth, me, my very late youth with an 84 car, right? Um, I've had still, three of these. Pardon me? I've owned you've three had, of these. You've had three. Tell yeah. me about them. Uh, my first one, uh, I remember, uh, Dave, this is my favorite. It was one of my favorite. I'm a dumbass stories because it was like 1990. There was an internet board at my college. I went to Lehigh University and it was super early. It was just within campus and you could browse listings of stuff for sale. And there was a car for sale. It was an 83 Rabbit GTI. Guy wanted 2600. I got it for 2300. That thing was a brilliant driver's car. Changed my life. But did I recognize, huh, that? bulletin board to buy and sell cars was really handy. This could be the next best thing. No, 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 no. That never even entered my mind. <laughs> <laughs> but that car totally opened my eyes to what driving feel felt like. I just, yeah. uh, it, it, it really changed my life. It was a brilliant, brilliant car. You remember the, uh, the, uh, the advertising, the, the, you know, back when TV ads were everything yeah. because there was no internet, uh, little GTI. I mean, it was just, brilliant to kind of reintroduce the gti as the spiritual successor to the pontiac gtl it was a it was a great and funny move that uh, volkswagen pulled off of that so these cars in 83 this is how bad things were they were quicker in the quarter mile than a pontiac trans am oh yeah and Mm -hmm. um this was the 83 rabbit gti was the first time that the u.s got this hot hatch that vw came out with in the late 70s in germany and um, it was so bad. Everybody loved it. They had manual steering, five-speed box, about 95 horsepower, and just a really crisp Gisaro box shape that even to, the, to this day, I think, is a super handsome car. I remember driving by the Volkswagen factory in Westmoreland, Pennsylvania. They were yeah. made in the United States. So um, let's see. I got out of college in 92, and... This car for two years, I had buzzed around Bucks County, Pennsylvania in one and just knew every road. I loved it, loved it, loved it. And the car was beat to, you know, shreds. Shreds. Yeah. So yeah, we- I had to get rid of it. And then for my 20 year college reunion, I thought, man, it'd be really fun to have a GTI back there. So I found one a year ahead of my reunion. I restored it. And then I took it back to Bucks County for my reunion. You know what I found out, Dave? What's that? You can't go back. 
Yeah, I know. You can't go back. You're absolutely right. And the car, I was like, this thing is such a POS. All it does is buzz and shake. And, you know, our friend Jason Camisa is real into Volkswagen. He's got a cabriolet of this vintage that he just loves. And I said, Jason, I didn't remember being such a pile of junk. And he goes, oh, those Westmoreland cars were hideous. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. No, well. I sort of fantasize about getting a rabbit GTI. They were called Gauls, but one from Germany, because his his German built Cabriolet is leagues ahead of our American built GTIs. But okay, back to this car. I don't even have a guess. This one has about seventy six thousand miles on it. It looks pretty straight and original. Hard to know what something like this could go for. What's your guess? Uh, somewhere between our number three and our number four. Uh, number four is oh. 8,300 and our number three is 17,300, which is a big jump. I mean, it's almost a little bit more than twice as much. I would say this car is probably a 15 car, wouldn't you say? <gasps> really? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Uh, if you look down on it, it does say that there are rust bubbles. So uh, warning Will Robinson, but, uh, you know, plenty of fun left. I, I just, you know, the one I restored, the plastic, you know, no matter what you do, the plastic is aging every minute. Oh, yeah. And it was so brittle, like you blew on some of the stuff and it just boom, exploded. Yeah. So yeah. neat, neat car. Well, yep. we'll have to see what happens with that one. All right. The next one on your list, Dave, is uh, this wacko Mercedes. Yeah. Uh, a Maybach uh, S, what is it? Uh, S600 uh, for sale in uh, Vicari auctions in Biloxi. Uh, not a lot to be said about it because it's coming up. I, you know, somebody told me about a year ago, they said the, the early Maybox were the Mercedes 600 of this generation, totally overbuilt, impossible to keep on the road unless you're a mechanic or know a lot about it, but really great reward in terms of driving. I don't think we need to say too much about it. Uh, because there's a lot of them out there. A friend of mine has sold two of them to Europe, two U.S. spec ones to Europe, which I thought is interesting. Uh, both of them high miles cars that he couldn't get anything for them here in the United States. Uh, so I think the Europeans are kind of looking out for them more than we are. So eh, it's just a little warning. That's all. We don't need to say anything else. about Well, it. I mean, if, if memory serves, this was a $300,000 car in 2016 when it yep. was new, right? Yeah, exactly. V12. Exactly. Yeah. Harder to find. You know, the ultimate Maybach is the legacy brand of the pinnacle of Mercedes, right? Sure. Absolutely. I mean, the Maybach back in the, you know, in the day, and which was the 1930s, was, uh, uh, you know, basically the Graf Zeppelin of uh, oh. automobiles. This huge thing that, uh, you know, that announced its presence about a, an hour before it showed up. I mean, the you know, the old joke about you had to, you, you know, when you went to the restaurant, you had to call ahead for parking uh, because the thing was so huge. Uh, not for a reservation for the table, you can get that, but you needed a place to park it. So, I mean, this is back to the heritage. You can still get a Maybach. Now it's a sub-model of the S-Class Mercedes. Yeah, but right. uh, at one time it was a, a separate standalone brand and that was back when this happened. Yeah, it's going to be interesting because you, they don't really make cars like this anymore. And yeah. there's a certain type of folk that they want a car. They feel like there's elegance to it rather than an SUV or an Escalade. Exactly. So I understand why there's still demand for these. Any sense of what something like this is going for today? Probably either side of a hundred grand. Um, oh. You know, I don't know. I haven't uh, drilled down on this. I don't know how many miles are on it and all that sort of stuff. But uh, uh, somebody else is, can take a look at it and, and, you know, hey, a trip to Biloxi. What could, yeah. be, uh, what could be wrong with that? The I next mean, one. You know, it's in the fall. It's oh, good. sorry. The, the, we'll have to see how that my box sells. The next one I'm really curious about, I know you have some strong opinions. It's the last of the one of the last of the incredible Dodge Challengers. I know you're joking. Yeah, yeah, no, this is the this is the jailbreak last call. Okay, I I think <laughs> I think the next one's going to be the. I love those guys. The, they're they're the, freaking brilliant. The jailbreak last call slash final call. This time we're not kidding. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, anyhow, 23 Dodge Challenger, $99,000 list. I'm watching this thing to see what it's actually going to go for. I know the dealers were getting, you know, 50, 60 over on these cars. I'm wondering if in this kind of new marketplace we're facing, whether that's going to stay or whether that's going to go. And I think that's a really going to be a really interesting indicator. You know what? Let's look at this car next uh, next time we get together and see what it actually sold for. I'm going to say it's going to no sell at 125 to 130. That's a prediction. What do you think? 
I think it's going to sell at 150. Yeah, you could be right. I mean, yeah. there may be uh, the list price. The sticker price is ninety three thousand dollars. This car is basically brand new. It has nineteen miles on it. The Challenger goes out of production any day now. You know, yeah. maybe if there's a strike, it may do it. Yeah. Dodge has announced there's not a gas one coming back. No, I know. So, I know. so I feel like, and I this is just a perception, a feel that there is a lot of angst about this electric version that might be next, no matter how often we're told it'll be just as good, it'll be different, but you'll love it. I don't think anybody's buying that. Yeah. So they I want think, yeah, they want to lock right. this in. No, I mean I, I think having a nice car an ice car like this is a really good idea. But I will say you can go back a couple of years by ninety percent of it for about, you know, uh fifty percent less. So there well, there's wait. that. Oh so. my god. Oh my god. Did you just forget the the schooling you gave me a half hour ago about? The I'm talking about uh, having a car to drive. You know, not all of us buy to invest; we buy to have fun. Remember, you said that, and I. Agree I know, you. but if if that Speedster is three hundred grand, and this Dodge yeah, yeah. Well, jailbreak last call final version, we don't really we really mean it this time. Yeah, is it worth fifty percent more than sticker? I don't know. You know, I mean, there is. I'm finding the the price of things is so fascinating these days because the price of something is an indicator of its value, right? Exactly. And in a competitive market where you don't have uh, freedom to to charge what you'd like because of competition, people get used to the idea that really um, price reflects quality. And I think we're starting to see that being taken advantage of. I do think that Mustang GTD, as cool as it is, that new one, at $300,000 that they're going to sell it for, I think that's just a, we think we can get this price. Yeah. Does that, does yeah. that make sense? I think they'll get it, though. That's, uh, yeah. you know, that's the difference. I mean, you know, you could look at it another way that it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, what, uh, eight-tenths of a uh, Ford GT for uh, one-third of the price for some people. So, you know, hey. Well, all right, all right. These, I think these Dodge Challengers and all the version, you're gonna need a whole book on all the different, you know, ones that they do. But it's over 700 horsepower. Yeah, I don't it's know amazing. What else you need to know. Uh, it, it's an it, incredible yeah, car. It, they are incredible cars. We are all agreed about that. I'm just wondering about the short term value. I'm not concerned about the long term value, but it's the short term. You know, there's gonna be a lot of people who bought these whose life changed for whatever reason. They get married, they you know, want to buy a bigger house, they're moving to Florida, whatever they're doing. Um, at some point for the next few years, there's probably gonna be a few bargains out there. Okay, but the next, Larry, well, well Larry, the last car, and I will say that I should tell you that my battery is on three percent right now, so we're gonna have to make this the last car. All right, all right. Two thousand well, we've been on it for an hour, so I mean we're I'm it's sick fair, of you. I am sick game. of you. Thank you. Uh, that we, we're sick of each other before it started. We know that <laughs> your car is awaiting you at the Meekum Dallas sale. By the way, that's where that uh, Dodge Challenger was as well. So we got two from Meekum Dallas coming up here. Your 2008 Bentley Continental GTC convertible in red with a silver hood. I think, you know, Larry, this says I might be big poppy, but this says big Daddy. Papa. Big Papa. Papa. Big Papa. Sorry. Big Papa. But this is Big Daddy, and this is your car. Red I with can, a silver yeah. hood. No, I think you no. deserve this. No, you no, 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 deserve no. this. I am stiff suburban dude. You, with your bald <laughs> noggin and your just demeanor, your big papa, this is your car all day. Yeah, you, yeah. You, you could run this thing. It is pretty wild. This came from the factory like this, right? I think it did. Yeah, it's yeah. actually red. I checked the door jams and, uh, you know, the car was built red. And I don't know if somebody put, uh, you know, a cowling or whatever. I think they probably did this as a two tone. Boy, does this car say Dallas, Texas, USA to me. I mean, if they <laughs> if they put it with white and a blue top, I think it would have been even better or just a lone star on the top or something like that. But uh, I love this car for its Dallasness. Yeah, now, it's a 2008. We've got these in the price guide. So a uh, number one tops out at 80 grand, 79.5. And a number four comes all the way down to 44 grand. So I'm thinking this car is probably a three. So we're talking 53. If it's a two, maybe we're talking 69, something like that like that yeah let's say you can buy this car for 60 grand 65 grand i think you should buy it larry well, this I car mean, is you just alone the i mean without the continental bentley would not be still around i don't think oh absolutely I absolutely mean, this car uh audi owns bentley and they took two vr6 engines 
slapped them together to make this really interesting W12. It's a 12 yep. cylinder motor, 550 yep. horsepower. And it's got sort of, uh, you know, the German chassis that feels really good. Um, so uh, these are really fascinating cars. And especially, you're right, in this color, all it needs is like a Longhorns on the hood. And you are good to go. I will polish my uh, polish my noggin before I drive it. Okay, so the sun will reflect off of my uh, head. You know, like the idiot who has the uh, you know the extra chrome on their car, so when you're following, you can't see anything. <laughs> I'll, I'll do the same thing. So, do you think uh, a car like this, Dave, is the point of it? I guess there's a lot of it, it's a conspicuous consumption purchase, right? You know, I think the Bentley less than the Rolls, but yeah, um, okay. there's no doubt about it. No doubt but, about it. But you know, it's not um, the driving experience is is quite stately and comfortable and the way that they have the uh windshield means there's not a lot of buffeting so it is really really pleasant but they're very you, comfortable cars to drive there's yeah no you, doubt about it you want to yeah. advertise your affluence and like hey man i made it screw you this car is pretty good for that no for i don't think it's quite as in your face as that i mean i really? think it's more it's more like um you know i sold my company so everything's fine or i won the lottery that everything's fine i mean more that i sold my company than i won the lottery so uh, but you know hey teach their own i'm a better guy so or what can i say my kid decided not to go to college so here we there go there you go i'm spending his college money i like that <laughs> or her college money perfect perfect well uh thank you dave really interesting um it's a great time to be sniffing around is is my my conclusion from our discussion today anything from you well, I would just say that it's also a great time to drive. I mean, I think that autumn oh, yeah. roads are the best roads. And so you don't have to worry about the snow yet. Uh, the touristos are mostly gone, except for in the, uh, what, the states where they have the leaf peepers. The peepers, yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. But uh, I think there's some wide open roads out there that everybody should, uh, you know, take some time and get up and, uh, uh, you know, take their far favorite car out. And, of course, without... Uh, you know, exceeding the uh, speed limits, so they should uh, get out and enjoy the drive. I think that uh, uh, the Blue Ridge Parkway, all that sort of stuff, not far no, from me. No, 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 no. Blue Ridge Parkway has like a 30 mile an hour speed limit, Dave. You know that road is no, 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 no. Well, actually, in this Bentley, mm -hmm. it might be kind of nice on the right evening. All right. Uh, for uh, for a uh, for a short drive, I can do a short drive on that. So okay. uh, you know that that's fine. But uh, yeah, but there's plenty of roads that are out there. The the B routes, the uh, you know the the blue routes, I guess they call them. Get off the interstate huh. and drive. How's that? Oh man, thanks for remembering. I couldn't agree with you more. It's a great time to drive, so get out there and enjoy. Well, thanks, Dave. Always fun to talk to you. I'm glad we made it for your meager battery power. One percent right now. All right, man. <laughs> Take care. Bye.